so I guess we can go ahead and get started. Um, real briefly, we're going to just give some like community updates with what we're doing with QC Flutter. Um, and then uh, Valeria is going to introduce us all to the Flutteristas uh, group. Uh, and then after that, uh, Mariano will be speaking about building Flutter apps with the web. Um, uh, just to give you a brief sort of intro of both, Valeria is an iOS and Flutter developer based in Chicago, member of the Flutteristas group, obviously. Um, and then Mariano is a tech lead at Venmo who um, is based in Argentina, um, has been working with mobile technologies for over 10 years. Um, and you are a member of a couple groups, GDG Buenos Aires, uh, Flutter De Devs BSAS, I think. Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires and SFXP. All right, so we don't really have a ton of updates today. Um, I know the last time we met, uh, we were, we basically went over um, um, some minor things. I did, if if you haven't noticed the meetup, we have like our own nice little uh, Queen City logo now. Um, I put a, I put in the minimal amount of effort to build that thing. So <laughs> if anybody wants to make any improvements, that's great. Um, also, um, Mark was recently uh, made a co-organizer and he's been helping me out uh, specifically with trying to create a, a open collective so that we can get some um, funding and allow members to contribute back um, for some of the minor uh, minor finance things that we have to take care of, like the Zoom meeting, stuff like that. So, um, with that, I will turn everything over to uh, Valerie, Valer Valeria, sorry. Um, she's going to tell us a little bit about uh, Floristas. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you so much for having me and for allowing us to have this uh, space to welcome everybody to our group. Um, yeah, and I actually, like we were talking about this and I actually, I think I'm the only woman in the group right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, but if you know any female developers or non-binary developers who are interested in joining us, uh, we have this group, it started at Google and then it, it's open for all women and non-binary uh, developers, designers, anybody who's interested in Flutter. Um, so the way that we're doing it is that if you see my name, it is vflutterista at uh, gmail. That is my email. And anybody who has, um, who knows any um, new members, anybody who could be interested in joining us, then they can have that email and they can send me, send me, um, they can send me an email there and I can send them a link so they can join us on our Discord channel. We share um, resources and mostly it's a place for um, women and non-binary uh, people to come together and feel supported because really it usually is like this. It's usually just one woman in a group of like 20 men. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it's just a place for us to have a place to talk and to share um, like, yeah, the resources and our experiences and what we're doing. And yeah, there's amazing um, people who are doing amazing, amazing work. So uh, yeah, again, my email is what you can see in my name right now is vflutterista at gmail.com. And if you know anybody who could join us, then please give them that email so they can get with me. Um, yeah, so feel free to um, share that email if you know anybody. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Mariano. And thank you guys again for having us. Thank you. All right, that's my time, I guess. So like Ryan said and Valerina, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Mariano Sorella. I'm, I'm a tech lead currently and Venmo on PayPal. I've been doing mobile pretty much for 10 years. I started with Android 1.5, 1.6 back in the day, uh, which has improved a lot, thankfully, since back then. But I think since I started moving more to management, not much into code and knowing so much Android, nothing really brought my attention until Flutter pretty much two years ago. Uh, that I started with Flutter. Uh, I did a few talks here in Argentina, and then I think when one when it was announced, pretty much uh, Google I/O with Flutter Web, I did my first example with Flutter Web, which was a game. And since then, I've been doing pretty much. If you follow me on Twitter, codes 
nonstop examples on Flutter web, pretty much. And I've been doing it on Dartpad, and now it's available also in, in Copen, which one of my examples on Flutter web is available there as well. Uh, in this case, I'm going to specifically talk about uh, Flutter web as um, not just only a web app, or what people think about a web app. I'm going to just share my screen. Let me see, there you go. So it's loading. Let me see if I can make it, there you go. It's all right, right? You can see guys? Yes, I can see. Perfect, thank you. So first of all, which are the requirements that we need to build on Flutter web? All right, one of the first requirements is we need to be on Flutter one, Point twelve plus. That means that if you are in a stable currently, if you are up to date with that one, you're safe. But I would suggest you, if you want to do more stuff, be uh, about 1.15, which gives you a lot of benefits like uh, PWA, progressive web apps. For people who doesn't know what that is, is you can install webs in your device and it will react if it were to like native apps. They have your own launcher icon and it will feel more like a, an actual app than just open a browser and get your website. In this case, uh, to make it more useful for having a backend, if you want to call, you got a product as a service. In this case, I'm going to use Firebase. Firebase score, if you use the, zero, uh, the version 0.444 plus 3, you can use it pretty much above the crew, like every single platform, Android, iOS, and web. I'm not so sure about Mac OS. I need to try it. So don't quote me that one, but I haven't tried yet. Uh, at least I know that it works on web. And for hosting, you can have your um, Firebase hosting. If you're using Firebase, you can have your own hosting service provider, or you can use uh, Search. Search is a free service. I don't know the limits of that one, uh, but it's really good if you want to make small examples. They give you pretty much a unit limit um, free websites that you can put. They're going to be whatever URL you want to put it, dot search that as such. And in that one, you can try the, the PWA because PWA, they, they require HTTPS hosting um, environments, websites in order to be able to use it. If not, the PWA are not going to be functional. Even if you try to do it um, while debugging your apps, the Chrome is going to suggest you to install the PWA but because you're in a development environment, it's not going to work. It's not going to install. Just to bear that in mind. Um, all right. A few small things and code snippets that you're going to see here. If you want to init your, your fibers, first thing, go to your um, project uh, prospect YAML. And you need to add the, the library that I put it right here. In this one, you add just right there, like it says right there, Firebase underscore core colon and the version or put any, it will take you the latest version. And then you're going to create a new project on Firebase. And you're going to put a new website as a project. Once you complete all that one, it's going to tell you that I didn't include it here. You need to update your index uh, HTML file, which you need to include a set of um, scripts in order to make it work. I'm going to share more in the demo. But in this case, as for the dark code, you only need to do this once, which is in your main. You need to change it as an async, as a feature, as a promise. And before they run in your app, you're going to make um, aware the app that is going to run Firebase. So what you check is, you check it's empty, so there's no app installed. And then because of that, it's going to init install this app. Later inside the app, you can call the, the Firebase uh, library and you can detect if the user is logging, if the user is logged out, and all this kind of different uh, scenarios that you can come across if you want to log users, if you want to call Firestore, and so on and so on. All right, this is a huge one, which I'm going to show a little bit more in the demo. But I think one of the biggest difference between Flutter, like mobile, Android, and iOS, and Flutter web is how do you think about your roots and your paths? Because remember, on the web, you can have your, I don't know, amazingurl.com slash about, slash download, slash, I don't know, anything, ID slash, and the name of the ID if you want to put like an article, for example, and if you want to show that a specific article. Every single example that I'm seeing online, they're going to use 
one that I'm going to show right now that is on generator roots, which it works, but it also creates a full stack of uh, pages. So if you want to go from uh, straight up to myamazingwebsite.com slash ID slash and the exact ID of the website of the article, it's going to open the home, which is slash, that's your main path. It's going to open ID, which is the page, uh, like the main one, and slash the ID itself, which is going to open three layers of stacks. So when you're going to go back, the user is going to be realized that it's going back to places he never knew he was there. So that's not a good UX. You want to go, the user sending it straight up to that URL. And pretty much what I'm doing is creating, which I'm going to show it in a demo, but I'm creating Navigator Stateful class. And the on init one, I need to put a, a feature delay because if you don't do it and if you try to make it, uh, it says state or send it through Navigator and stuff, it's going to send an error like the huge red screen um, for you. Uh, this way you avoid that one uh, and it's going to push. I, I use the push remove until because that way it removes every stack that you have. And even if it tries to create a stack, it's going to remove that for you. So it's only going to open the screen that you wanted. And because the path you can actually grab what is in the full path, it's like your awesomeurl.com. From there, every slash, all the path, you can grab that information from on generator roots. And you can actually do kind of like the logic that I'm doing here. If it's a slash, I'm taking it to your home. If it's join, take it to a specific join. If it's join, like the slash, join slash, that means that you have an ID. And the ID is going to be a specific one and different ones. I got results. I got about a lot of different ones. And if by any reason something broke, uh, I take the user to the home screen. I could take it to a 404. I don't have in my uh, one. So I pretty much send you straight up to the home screen if something goes wrong. All right. There's also a huge difference on how do you debug your websites. You don't have the special menu, if you want to call it on the right, on your Android Studio. That's the one that I use. And to use the debug pane, you need to open like here. You go to your Android Studio, you open your debug tools. And it's, if this is the first time you run it in your project, it's going to uh, tell you that you need to install or is installing your debug tools. Once it finished loading, it's going to open a, a URL for you to debug your app. And once it's that one, you can see the full stack of widgets, and you can debug paint, and you can see if the widgets are actually centered, if the orientation is correct, and all those kind of stuff that you do in the normal Android iOS um, uh, debug me. So we go to the demo. There you go. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger so you guys can see without issues. So this is called main just to avoid everyone getting my data from Firebase. So this is actually going to be replaced by your own uh, information. They, like I say, if you go to Firebase and you create a new project and a web project, it's going to give you the option in the settings uh, to set up your, your Firebase app. So all this information, literally like this in this order, is going to be provided by you and your settings for your own project. So don't worry about that one. It's super simple to do. You only set it once, and you're cool. Um, the other one is if you go to your left and you go to web, you're going to see there is a lot, a lot of um, uh, files that you don't see before if you come from versions below 112 and 115. The first one is the index in HTML. Like I said, you need to add these three new lines. Check the version because normally this updates crazy a lot. So the newest version, I think, is 7.14. I'm in currently in the version 7.13. No changes. But what I'm doing, this one is, this is pretty much the core of Firebase. This one is the out, so I can make login. And this is Firestore, so I can use the backend as a service to provide information for my website. So you have to put all this script uh, about your main dark version. And by the way, this is a small tip. If you don't know, if you have a hosting, either Firebase hosting, if you're using uh, GitHub pages, if you make a change and you publish a new change, if you change this, three, four, blah, 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 and so on and so on, you're telling the browser 
they're, the version they, they try to run from the JavaScript is the null one. So it's going to clear the cache for you and it's going to run the new version. Trust me, this is super useful because when you're pushing something to production and you make a mistake and you want to push a uh, change, you're not going to see it for minutes to hours until a clear the cache for you. Either you have to manually remove all the cache or wait uh, to the browser to clear the cache. If you, by simply meaning, change the version of it, that's it. That's all you needed. It's going to take the new version. You're ready to go. This one, you probably never saw it before. If you come in and see the, the index HTML, this one creates the server worker. What is this for? It's for the PWA, the progressive web apps. This allows your app to be installed in your device. And not only that, everything that you have in your assets folder, like images and fonts and stuff, that's going to be pre-cached for you. So every time you run a PWA, it doesn't have to load the images from scratch, like trying to decode the images and show it on the screen. It's going to get the cache images. And it's going to straight up uh, show it for you. So bear that in mind. It's super useful. You don't have to do anything else. You don't have to set up anything else. Every time you make a new build, you're going to have this a specific JavaScript that is going to be generated for you. So you're going to see that everything in the assets folder is getting a hash. This hash is the one who's going to be cached and is going to get that cache information for you. Uh, but you're not going to see here. So bear that in mind. Manifest JSON. So this one is the PWA information that you need for your app. So if you want to install on your device, uh, this one will be pretty much created for you. You don't have to add anything else. Uh, the one that is going to be changed, you're going to see something like minimal UI. This one is the stock um, web version. So if you keep it this way, it's going to open your browser with the, with the URL on top and all the stuff. And it doesn't feel like a native app. You have to change it for standalone. Standalone is going to remove anything Chrome browser related. And it's going to give you this full screen, beautiful uh, for your app. And you can customize as much as you want it. And it's going to feel like native uh, from the scratch. The theme color and the background color, this one are using for when you launch the app. It's going to put your icon. It's going to put your name. And it's going to put a background. The background is going to be the background color. And the theme color is going to be, if you're using Chrome, you see that sometimes your um, uh, your websites have a, a specific uh, browser, well, like address bar with color. It takes with the theme color. So if you want to change that one, you can change that one from there. You can also change it from the index HTML. Remember, this is everything is compiled as a JavaScript. So Technically, it's the same as building any website. It doesn't matter if you start the one we're going to write the code on it, but everything else is being taken from here. So if you want to add a title, if you want to add descriptions, if you want to add uh, in keywords, if you want to add all the Twitter, I think I got it in this one. Let me just show you. Uh, there you go. If you got like the Twitter title, images, descriptions, and stuff. so. When you copy the URL on any social media, in this case, it's going to be Twitter and pretty much OG is pretty much for Facebook, LinkedIn, Medium, and other ones. It's going to take this information. It's going to take the title. It's going to take the type. If it's a website, it's going to take a description, blah, 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 and so on. The Twitter has different sizes. I use the large one. So when you put it, you got like a huge, nice image. The image needs to be from an HTTPS source. So you can use the Firestore, the Firebase storage to keep your image. And you need to put it, if you want, in a specific folder with read permissions. Every, pretty much every uh, time you set up the storage, it's going to be only for users who are logging in. So if you change that logic, that rule to make it readable for everyone, you can have that one and use it as a, as a thumbnail if you want to put it for your image. And then you can add more information. Like I'd say, you can add copyrights. You can tell the robots if you want to index your website or not, if you want description, keyword, blah, 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 and so on and so on. Like I mentioned in the navigation example one, if you're taking this, which is pretty much what everyone does in terms of 
uh, paths in routing, you will have your own generator route. So every time you have a, here's my website. Oops, sorry. Uh, here's my website. So every time you do something here, like if I want to put login slash login, uh, this is being called the, the main Dart. And it's going to pass through here, the on generator routes, and it's going to pass to settings. Settings could be name. It doesn't matter. You can put it, I don't know, name. Uh, OK, I cannot, I can put, I don't know, path. I can put path. There you go, path. I can put any name. It doesn't matter. Uh, this one's going to take uh, uh, root settings. And if you get the name of it, it's going to take the path. And you got a lot of other information. So you can take arguments if you have like, um, the ampersand or the question mark, and you have all your arguments defining in your pad, you can take that one as well. Right now, for me, I'm only taking the slash for the home, slash login, and slash admin. If by any reason you remove one of these, like for example, like this, uh, the only thing that it does is that you cannot access through that a specific pad, like here. If I put a slash admin, in this case, it's reachable. But if I put something like, I don't know, something is going to send me back to the home screen because it doesn't have that pad. And because it doesn't have that pad, it doesn't know where to send. And because I only put uh, default the home screen, everything else outside the any possible case is going to be to send it through your, your default. Or if you had a home, you can put your home and you can define it like this, uh, which let me check if it's correct. Home. Oh, I think it's home screen and that's it. It takes a widget. Yeah, it takes a widget. So this is going to be your home. Avoid that. Try to manage everything from your roots. Um, but don't do it this way. This is the cheapest way to do it. What is going to happen if I open slash login, it's going to open slash, which is the home, and a slash login. So I will have two screens when the user only wanted to go to login. So that's a bad user experience. If you're coming from mobile, it makes sense. Because if you're using deep linking or something, if you want to, for example, on Twitter, open a DM, and you want the user to go back to the screens because you want to keep the user inside your app. But Wave uh, is a little bit different. Maybe you want something specific. Maybe you want to open an article, and that's it. If you want to keep it open or just close it, that's one of the chances you have. Uh, don't take this approach. You can take this following approach, which is if you go to the main, don't see over there. There you go. Um, this one is a better approach. What I did is the on generator routes, the settings, I'm passing through a, a stateful widget. What this stateful widget does, if I go over here, is first of all, it takes a simple, this is a class that I can share later if you want it. It's a page root. It's same as material page root, but this is a stock one that I can customize no matter what. I can do whatever I want. In this case, I can put animation, I can put fade animations or the title animations, what I do is I avoid the material or Cupertino animations because web doesn't have that kind of animations. And it's going to look weird for the users, more like a web app than a web. And this is specific widget, which is called title. This one is going to put the title here on the top of your website. So everything you put a name on that title is going to update here. So if I go to slash login, it's going to put login here which is super useful. You always get the user like comprehensive information. In the case of my slides, it will have the names of my slides. In this case, for example, if I want to go to this one, I'd say join. It is going to say join on the top. If I want to see the results, I talk here. In this case, join as well. But I can, I can put about, for example, and it says about us, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a super, super useful widget. If you guys didn't know it, it's awesome. Use it. It's great for Flutter Web. And if you're using it on mobile, it's not going to make any difference because you're not going to see that title. Um, so it doesn't affect your code. You don't have to put if web, then do this. If not, then do that. So going back to the navigator, in this case, what I'm taking is I'm sending the path through the, cons if you want to call kind of constructor of this static method, which is going to take the root. And it's going to build my stateful widget for me. And the init state, I'm taking this feature delay just to avoid the red screen of that. And I take the path, which is like, again, the string that I pass it through the on generator roots, which is going to be my settings name. And I have the slash, the slash join. I check if they're equal. In that case, the 
user specifically put that URL. But if this one contains, I know it's better ways to do it, but this one is the fastest way that I can find it is if it contains two slashes, that means that the user most likely to put an ID further than this slash. Uh, so I can detect and I can send the user to one specific screen if I want it. So I can take the path, I can split that one and I take the split this one and I take the second, like the third index, which is going to be my URL join and then the ID. That's going to be my index too. That's the information that I wanted to send to this join the screen. For the uh, small demo that I have here, how do you make the logging? It's fairly simple. All you have to do is you need to init your, let me put it a little bit bigger. You need to init your Firebase, which you can call it whatever you wanted. I put the ass as a small alias, so I can call it easily. And if it has methods uh, called similar to others, I'm never going to have any issues over the website. So if I put this one, so the login. Login is one of the simplest ways to do it. Like any other library that I can find out. It's so simple, you just put, if you got a, an email and password, you just literally put sign in with email password and you take the, your uh, text fields and you pass the controllers with the information. And if it goes correctly, you just log in the user. Like in this case, you, I handle the, the state. And if by any reason the user put any wrong information, you can catch and get that information. And that actually is gonna send you a string of different errors, which again, I took the approach of if else, it contains different ones. So in the case of formatted, that means that your email is not correct. So if I'm going here and I do this and I do like blah, 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 and blah, 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 it's gonna tell you that my email is not, or either doesn't exist or it doesn't have the correct format. You see, it doesn't have the correct format, but if I use an approach of an actual email, um, and if I put a wrong password, it says your password is invalid. But if I pass to the correct password, oops, not that one, there you go, login. It's gonna log in. If you save this, in the future, it's gonna um, remember for you. So if you put your email, it's gonna uh, put the password for yourself. If by any security reasons you don't wanna do it, just put never on your Chrome, and it's not gonna store the information. This approach is going to the slash admin. What the slash admin does in this case, admin, admin, admin. I'm checking if the user actually exists. And if by any reason the, the user actually exists, that means that the user uh, is logging. If the user doesn't exist, Firebase queries for you. So it's always going to be null if by any reason the user is null. So that way you can know if the user is logging or not. What I can do with this, if I go back to the home screen, like in this case, I can check if the user is logging and I can suggest something like this. I can put the user as a, hey, hello, the name of the, of the user. You can get that name if the user is logging in from social media, for example, you can get the, the, the name of that person if it goes through Facebook, Google, uh, login and others. The image, I take this, I created a separate uh, fire, uh, Firestore uh, collection that I call users. And one small trick that I come up with uh, Firebase is I set a rule of um, different permissions. So you got, let me see if I can show it here. I should have a different set of permission like admin and different ones. I go to the, um, let me see my user, user, user. I got a role. So the user can be an admin, could be an editor, or it could be a viewer. The good thing about enums on Dart is that you can take the index of the enum and you can compare those. So what I do in my Firestore, I put zero as a, the like the highest level, which is gonna be the admin. It's one, it's gonna be for the editors and the viewers is gonna be two. So it's super it's small information that I store in my Firebase. If I want an admin, I put zero. And what this does, if when the user log in into, I can go back to login. Uh, logins, I can give more actions that if the user was an editor, for example, I can block the editor to actually remove uh, articles from my website. So I will any mistakes, but I'll allow them to edit, for example. And if I'm a viewer, I will never get to the screen, for example. So I can protect my information that it's not gonna be changed. And for example, if I wanna change one of these ones, in my case for my website, I just put it like here, I can update the information information is going to be done. 
And if you go back to your home screen, which I can do it like this, whoop. And if it's working, oh, by the way, if you're in the latest, latest, latest version of Flutter, um, I think master channel, it's a little bit broken. So hot reload, like now apparently is broken. Yay, yeah. So bear that in mind. Uh, there you go, now it's working. So you have to try a little bit of time. So it, it doesn't say upload and update it anymore in this case. So I can change it. I think if I go to login, it logged me out. Yes, I put the log out and I can log in back again. And three, there you go. I can go back and I can see that my article is now updated with the latest information. If I want to delete one, for example, if I want to delete this one, I just simply delete. I delete the collection for my Firestore. So when I get back to the home screen, now I should have one less item, like in this case, and it's, uh, it's working. Other thing, super, super, but super important, using Flutter Web is responsive, responsive, responsive. You want the user to scale your website and don't break. And it's going to be adaptive for users. Trust me, there is many ways you can do it. You can use the media query and detect like breakpoints using the size width of your screen. Or you can use the layout um, builder and you can use the constraints to make a similar logic and create breakpoints for your website in order to make it happen that way. In this case, I'm using the, the grid view, which I put it depending on the breakpoints that I put it on the, my website. If it's below X amount of uh, pixels on the width, I change it to two elements on screen. And if I put it one, which is a super trick, uh, grid view with one element is actually a list view. Uh, bear that in mind. So you don't have to change between a list view and a grid view if the user is uh, watching from a mobile perspective or from a, a web perspective. Uh, that one is super useful. So always try to use uh, your columns, your rows. Even you can use a grapper. For example, this one is a website that I did um, on Flutter uh, web as well that I use. Um, more specific web stuff. For example, I take the height to make sure that everything in the first view looks the same. You can use the, what is called um, hover. Ooh, I forgot the name. I think it's called, let me just check it. Uh, hover, mouse, mouse hover. I think it was called mouse hover or hover, hover region. There you go, hover region. region hover. Mouse, ooh, mouse region, sorry. And you got the on hover. On hover, what it does, it takes also details, details, and you can get the details with the a specific local position, like X and Y, and all that different information. This one is super useful if you want to track the user to know if it's uh, touching one specific widget. For in this case, for example, I'm hovering and I'm like showing the tooltip, but if I tap on one of those and I use the of the global key, I can get the position from my scroll view and I can tap and I can go to that specific part of the website. This one is super useful. That's not something that you think about it on the mobile, but on the web, it is really useful. And these three elements, I put it inside a wrap. What a wrap does is if the website, like the width is not enough for you, it's gonna jump below, like if it was kind of like a grid and you can take gravity as well, like an alignment, to put if you want it to the left, to the middle, to the right. So if I go to a smaller, this way, it's gonna jump into two elements. And if you keep going and going and going, it's gonna send to my screen on like this one. Other one, if we go into this case, uh, to the login, you also gonna notice that I can change the view from uh, having always on my side the elements that I wanted, uh, for example, the articles, compose, logout, et cetera, et cetera. But if it goes to a, a specific threshold that I can put it as a mobile view and I can put a drawer menu. This one's very useful because I will not have enough space on the screen, but it still works the exact same way. It doesn't change anything on your app. You got the same user experience just by changing that small thing. And I think I can show that one in the, um, in the admin. And I can show that breakpoint that I'm using is specific for this one. So let me search width. There you go. So I'm checking if the width is 
below 600, that means that I'm on a mobile layout. So if I'm a mobile layout, I can change stuff. For example, if I want the app bar or not, I can change that one. For example, the app bar is actually preferred size. So if you pass a size of zero, that means that you don't have an app bar. You can remove that one to avoid getting drawers and all the different stuff. If you want it, you can keep it that way. That way, if the users, in this case, is not access with the correct information. For example, if I log out and I try to add access the admin, and it's going to tell me that you don't have permissions because you just log out. If the hot reload works for me this time as well. There you go. All right. Try to go to the admin and it say access denied because that way I log out the user. It's not currently logging on Firebase. The user cannot log in. But I need to remove the app bar. I need to remove everything on the screen to make sure that they don't see or they have any way to trick possible way to access to my application. We don't want that. So be super careful about that one. Um, what else that I have that is super useful for Flutter Web? Um, yep, every time that you want to move, like in this case, I take the app bar and if the user clicks on the logo, the user can always go back to the home screen. That way the user doesn't have to go back or doesn't have to put the URL. I always have an easy way for the user to come back. You only put a gesture detector, you put the, you can use the approach of the uh, push until remove or push name to remove. If you got the on generator roots, like in this one, uh, this approach, uh, you can use just the slash and it's gonna work for you. But if you need more information from the user, like I did in this example, you have to use the push and uh, remove until, because you can actually pass your, in this case, I always forgot the name, you root, uh, to make that happen. So you can pass the information that you needed or you can pass a new value telling that the user uh, either log out or just sign out or different the status that the user can have on a web that is completely different from anything else on on a mobile. That we don't have these case scenarios on a mobile and just bear that in mind. Um, the rest is pretty much the same, doesn't have many difference. The thing you're gonna notice is Maybe your app is not going to work the same on Chrome. It's not going to work the same on Safari. It's not going to work the same on Firefox. Uh, there is, remember that Flutter Web is still in beta. That means there has a tons of bugs, but it's still that doesn't mean that you cannot do amazing stuff on Flutter Web. I do production stuff, for example. This one is a production one that I did it and I released it yesterday that is available. It is fully, fully done with Flutter Web. There is no compromise in this one. And the only, I would say, kind of compromise that I have is Flutter Web can, doesn't have the Skia uh, render engine running, but you can make it run. So when you make the Flutter build web, you can enable the feature of Skia, but it's, uh, it's not as stable as you want it. For example, in this website that I did, this one is key enabled because it has so, so much images and so many stuff that if you run this one on low end devices, it's not going to run well. So I have to enable Skia to make it run fast. But for example, image.network is not running on Skia. You have to use image.memory. And in order to get the information from memory, you have to use the get um, from HTTP to get the, the images, get the virus, the U and a list and then you pass it as memory. So there is a lot more stuff that you need to run. For example, this one is the Flutter Yeti web app. This one is also uh, Flutter web and it's done with ski enabled. This one goes super fast, runs amazing on the web. Um, and this one didn't have any compromise, but the, uh, I think the current one that I have this one, because it uses a custom phone, that I don't think is well done from all browsers because it's an OTF and it's not a TTF um, uh, font. It's not running with a ski enable. So pretty much you will see uh, black boxes instead of the, the actual text. So bear that in mind. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. If your app runs perfectly with ski enable, go for it. It's going to run like a native app. Really does run like a native app. And the thing that I was saying about the service worker is over here, you will see the plus button. So you can actually install your apps in, for example, Mac OS. And I can literally run the app and make it happen. I don't think, yes, it's, it's installed already. 
So I can literally have like this, an app install on my computer. And I can do, have it like here with a name, with a logo on different stuff. I got the, also the news one. I also have it like this. I can have the different looks. Like if I have the mobile look, if I want to resize, or I can have more like a desktop view and all stuff. It's really cool. It keeps the title, like I'd say, if you go to About Us, it's going to update for you the About Us information. But if you think about more PWA, remember that you don't have the, the address bar on the top. So make sure your app is fully uh, flow-ish as possible. Like if you want to move between the screens, uh, make sure you got everything available for this. Think more of the PWA as a native app, like if it was Android and iOS. Think it about that way. And if you're using just the web stuff, think it about as a, as a web. Make sure that the user can go to about and they can actually access that specific information without having any compromise. I uh, think about, ooh, all right. Thank you. There you go. And it's going to go to about, and there you go. It's, it's a little bit funky for me. I'm using the debug uh, Chrome, so it's not always working. Again, if you're using the latest version of master, uh, hold reload and all other specific stuff are broken. So every, I will say four or five times you hold reload, you need to uh, uh, pretty much stop your Flutter web and do it again and make it. It doesn't take too much. It takes a few seconds, and that's it. Other than that, everything that you do uh, on the web is really straight up the same, same as well as any mobile app. And when you want to release, you just pretty much open your terminal. You grab Flutter, build web, and it's going to create a new build which is going to create a new web. And all this folder, you can push it to Firebase, you can push it to search, you can put it to your own hosting. And that's it, that's pretty much what you need. In this case, I think I have a public. Uh, I don't think this one, I should have in this one a public. Public is the folder that is generated for you by Firebase. It could be named anything by stock default, it's called public, it's gonna have a uh, 404 HTML and an index HTML, delete those two, copy straight up the build web into this folder, and that's it. Push into your web and it's gonna run instantly. And again, if you don't update the version, and if you did any changes, you're not gonna see in real time. You need to wait for your browser to clear all the cache and pretty much wait for it or clean by yourself. If you update the version, like I'm doing this version, I'm currently a six, but if you prefer five, uh, it works as well. If you're using pop dev to deliver examples, now that we have a dar pad and other um, like ways to deliver Flutter web, also make sure that if you put an example for your pop dev, like I did one that I posted today, also update that version because GitHub pages don't update until you update that version. So if I put to pop dev and if I search my package, which I'm going to take any package, I'm going to take whole, I think it was called hover effect. Let me check. There you go. This is hover effect. So I put an example for this one. So if you go to like here, this is the example being done on Flutter web. This one doesn't have any ski enable and it's running fast. But if I didn't update the version, this will have the cache all version of it and it's not going to run properly. And it also allows me to install as a, um, as a PWA from GitHub. If you don't know how to do that, it's super simple. All you need to do is create in a specific folder, like public in this case, or you can put a docs. And then when you push your code into GitHub, and you go to the settings and the project and you scroll down and scroll down, enable pages, and you put which folder and you put a docs, it's going to create that URL for you. And that way, this is a super, super, super simple and free way to share Flutter web examples with everyone you're on it. Even if you want to do like a, your own project or your production one, it doesn't matter. For example, every website that is released, it's actually behind the doors of Flutter web app. So if I go to news, I think it was called news Flutter that search that sh. This one is using uh, the search sh uh, um, domain, 
which is a free one. But if in this case, this is my own custom domain. If I go to, I think it was called beta web app. This one is created by Firebase. So you can use the URL created by Firebase, but because Firebase is linked to Google, you can buy a Google domain link and you pretty much put the address of that one into Firebase and you can do things like this to put it your own custom domain. And that one is going to redirect or actually not redirect. It's like, it's gonna use behind the doors your Firebase hosting as a full hosting pretty much. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much everything that I have. Uh, let me just put back here. Uh, I would take any questions. I'm pretty sure that a lot of people were interested about Flutter Web and I can take all your questions right now. How is, uh, hey, thanks for that, by the way. That was an awesome presentation. Um, Thank you. Uh, how is how is accessibility uh, for web with Flutter? I, I know I deal with a lot of accessibility issues like with JavaScript, mm. um, uh, you know, on the as front end frameworks. And just curious if if you looked at that. Mm, I I haven't looked at it yet because I only did a small examples mostly for that part and the, this is small examples. I think there is no difference on the widgets that you can use on Flutter Web. So if you use the accessibility ones, that you if you if the user moves around the screen, it's gonna put if you can put like a name on it if you got an image. So it's going to tell that if your user doesn't have any visibility, it can send the audio of what the image or whatever uh, uh, widget is running through. Because Flutter Web actually renders everything on a canvas. So if you right click inspect, you won't see your divs, you won't see your piece, you won't see your bees. You're only gonna see a canvas. So everything is being draw pretty much like Android and iOS. So I would say oh, there, gotcha. I haven't tried it. I'm 99% I'm sure that you can use the exact same experience on Flutter, Android and iOS for accessibility and it's gonna work. Even if you have a button, if the user hold the press, it's gonna get the haptic feedback if you're an Android, for example, and it's gonna vibrate your phone. So that's on the web and it's using the same user experience as a mobile. Oh, that's awesome, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Maybe someone from the chat or someone else. So what do you generally recommend for the state management? Ooh, uh, there's no difference from from any other Flutter app. I think the only thing, I pretty much use set state for everything that I need in this one. You can use your, your blog, your Movex, your provider. I would suggest maybe provider more because every single screen is gonna have their own dependencies. So if you think of more and more like a dagger to dependency injection from Android, if you come from that way, uh, provider is gonna offer you a similar experience that you can put your models or whatever information you needed to consume and you gotta get for that specific screen. So I think I will go more to a provider one, but very much the websites have a lot of oh, kind of like empty data. If you got an about us, it's just a regular text that is not being taken from anyone else. Maybe the things that you got from your Firebase, Firebase have the streams or have your futures. Uh, so you can rely on Firebase as well, which is a simple call to your elements and you can map them and to show away on your screen. Um, but I haven't had the need so far to create any like state management complex thing. I use pretty much everything stateful and use the state and that worked for me. I just, I barely have any buttons and actions and everything was relying on Firebase. So Firebase has the future and I get the information and I move the user around or I show the user any information for them. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other question? If not, uh, I, have, I yep. have actually one. Um, so it looked like, uh, first of all, I'm excited to try out some Flutter for web. Um, <laughs> I think it's pretty intriguing. And I already shared with some of my team at work about the uh, code pen stuff that mm -hmm. came out today that Ryan yeah. posted in channel. Um, so it looked like, some of the things right now that you had coded on the example apps were real specific to, to the web versions. Um, 
uh, well, and PWAs, you know, which which mm -hmm. a lot of the PWA stuff looked familiar because that's PWA work I've done on in other frameworks. So that was great. Um, yeah. What have you had any experience or like what are your thoughts now trying Flutter for web and contrasting it with uh, Flutter for like Android and iOS and how you would the the dream of having one you know code base to apply to all of them? How how do you see that working? Um, in every example that I did so far, I haven't had the need to call the K is web to the differentiate if it's web or not. I know there is so many plugins that are yet to update. I think the only one that I really, really, truly needed to check if it's web, it's, let me check which one was it, well, in this one. Because the way that, um, what the library for copy something on the clipboard was really old. I think it was 2018, the last time it was updated. So when I get to, I think it was called a, to the clipboard, I needed to differentiate it if it's web. Yes, this one was the only example that I have to say, okay, this one is web, do this. If not, do that. Oh, wow. Yes, so I used the, the clipboard say data that was on native. It takes the regular native methods and it calls the clipboard. But on web, it's so funny because if you use this, if I pass URL, what it's gonna copy is URL, not the content of the string, which is, I don't know why. <laughs> so I couldn't manage to copy the actual uh, code from it. So there is a logic calling the actual document from the web getting the body, blah, 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 all the information. Um, by the way, you can use anything uh, JavaScript related. You can actually create elements, which is this text element. You can create input element, and you can open, for example, uh, files uh, from your computer. Um, you can open, I got an example when you can open the web, uh, the webcam, like the front facing camera from your device with uh, the, the, I think it was called video elements, something like that. You take the, any, uh, inputs coming from your device, either the audio or the cameras, and you can render those on a screen. So if you take pretty much document, document, I can pretty much check the, the body, the title, the head and all the different informations. I even think if I call window and document i should have yes you got the query selector so if you have something even in your index html i can actually call those a specific element on um, bad id or uh yep just call for id or um and pretty much get the information that you wanted one example that i did need to make a change it was last year uh which is getting improved now you can play audio on the web but i have to uh, create an audio tag on the body for that specific URL. And when the user move out, I remove that tag from that screen so it, it doesn't keep playing on the background. Um, but yeah, this the, in the past month, I did like five, six example, and this is the only one that I had to really check if it was wet. The rest, I didn't have to check anything if it was wet or not. Well, that seems pretty simple. That's great. Yep. Yep. It's pretty straightforward. The key, the key is web is your way to know if it's a web. And that's it. You can put an if if you want it. If not, anything else is like, even with the ungenerated roots, this doesn't change your logic inside of your app. So uh, when you run this as a native app, uh, you can keep the same flow as you have in a PWA or just install the app on Android and iOS and it's gonna continue working. This one is more specific if the, the user put the slash, whatever. Uh, yeah, we, the rest, no changes. Thank you. You're welcome. So Marianne, I had a quick question. Yep. Um, could you maybe speak a little bit to like, as far as like organization of your you know, folders and like kind of like Ooh. structure? I think we've talked about this in, some of our previous meetups, you know, since mm -hmm. everything's like still pretty new. Um, I didn't yeah. know if you had any like, any like comments on that, or I guess what you, how you decided to kind of structure some of your stuff. Well, a lot of my examples who ended up on, on DARPOD, they need to be in one file, sadly, because if don't, it doesn't work. So those live in a monolithic main, which, don't do it, <laughs> but that's 
work on Copad and Copen and like Dark Party Copen. Um, but if you're using, I would suggest taking more like a U. Well, in this case, I didn't use any logic. And this one, I was trying to make the approach, but this is a product that I released in two days. So my brain didn't think too much about structure. But I do put like a UI, which I know the specific screens that the user can put like slash whatever. Uh, they can, they all live in one specific one. I will create one for models. I will create one for utils. I will create one for a specific UI widgets. For example, I can call widgets. This one is a wave. For example, I create a path and this path creates like a beautiful shape path on it. And either it can live inside a noodles uh, web, uh, like, sorry, a noodles uh, class or in a specific folder for this specific UI things, um, which I think this is a full app actually. Yes, this is a full app that I created. It creates ways for you with the, uh, with the quadratic, yeah, with the quadratic brazier one. Uh, but the rest, this is, for example, the I think one of the only stateless widgets that I have is just a title and a subtitle. And it doesn't have to be a stateful, so I put it that way. But this could be in actually in, for example, one really use case is you can have a folder called sections. Because if you use a website like this one, <clears throat> that you actually have sections you need to split it in a way that is easy customized because you don't know how many sections of what's it can have. Like what's this can scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and have a lot of different sections, more in your home screen mostly. Uh, but yeah, uh, I will suggest if you're going to have like a home screen and if that home screen is going to have sections, just put a folder, it's called sections, and you then load this either stateless or stateful widget sections and you put it inside a column, like a, inside a single, um, a scroll view or you put it inside your sliver custom scroll and that way it's more memory management than the scroll view because the single scroll view remember everything is being loaded on memory bear that in mind that is the same case for android native code ios native code and flutter the scroll views load everything in memory this whole thing is everything is loaded in memory bear that in mind that could go really bad for low-end devices so if you really want to make some more customable list, like really, really customized well, use the sliver uh, custom scroll. That one, you can pass whatever sliver. It could be a list view, it could be a grid view, it could be a space, it could be a lot of stuff. You can actually put then in a specific section to make it like a super complex uh, list with horizontal scroll, vertical scrolls, uh, grids, uh, whatever. It doesn't matter. You name it. Cool. Thank you. Welcome. I've got a question. Uh, this is yep. wonderful. Uh, you had mentioned um, using provider. Are you doing mm -hmm. anything with streams uh, in the way you have your data calls, or have you messed with that at all? Uh, you mean your my paths to go to a one specific place, or uh, so? Uh, example: If you have something on, we'll just say like a like a. Firebase database or something along those mm -hmm. lines. You're using provider to get that. You can do it as an async call, or you can use the a stream and subscribe. To mm -hmm. that. Have you? Have in this you? Case, yeah, I, I didn't have that experience, but in this case, it's a really complex one. With a, for example, this is an example. This one will create for me a specific URLs that I can do it, which is not really a specific URLs. The only thing that I do is. I use the, um, the ID generated, or I can create a generated ID for the, the collection for my Firebase, for my document specifically. So what I do this is when I create, I create different URLs, which this doesn't exist. This URLs don't exist. I, the only thing that exists is this document on Firebase. So what I can do is I can copy this link. And if I go to that specific link, for example, it's going to take, like I say, the navigator. It's going to take, it has a pin. The pin is this one. I can copy the pin. I can paste the pin. And it's going to allow me to vote. This one is going to call specifically to that um, uh, document on Firebase. And it's going to get that information. So if I vote that I want an email, I don't want a meeting. Thanks for voting. Oh, one specific thing, if you go and use something like this, you can use a random generator alphanumeric number, and you can use the share preference uh, plugin that is working on the web. 
So if by any reason the user wants to vote again, it says you already voted. Because what I'm checking is if I'm sending the UID generated from the user in the moment of voting, and I put it to my Firebase collect as an inside collection of that document. So I check if that UID exists, and if it exists, that means that you already bought it. That's an easy way to like do that kind of logic. And if I'm the creator, I can open this one, I can check the results, and it says, okay, the current result, your uh, event is currently going, and currently people bought it for um, getting an email instead of a meeting. Um, but I haven't used any weird logic than provider or anything. I just use the my navigation first logic to get the path. And then I, depending on the path, I code my Firebase and I do whatever I want. Okay. Any other questions? A couple of questions. Sure. All right, uh, they're related. So first, um, if you're familiar with the, the version two of the router um, that's being worked on, how will that change routing for web apps? And then also, which is, this is kind of related, um, were there any instances where um, you were working on features and they ended up being harder to build in Flutter versus if you were building them with web technology? Hmm. Um, I did a talk about navigation with Simon Lightfoot. For the guys who don't know Simon, what you're doing, everyone should know Simon right now. <laughs> uh, he's really active in the community, mostly in the Flutter um, community. We have meeting posts and stuff. Uh, we did a talk about navigation and we show a small, it was a brief idea of what navigation 2.0 was going to be, but we are calling, I think it was December uh, last year. So that was a couple of months ago. I know that it's going to be released hopefully soon. I don't know how that much is going to change and it's going to impact, but I'm pretty sure that's going to be really focused on the web for the, all the issues that I mentioned. Like if you're going to go to like in this case, if I want to go to this specific path, if I use the own generator routes, not only is it going to create me this one, it's going to create me the result and it's going to create me the, the home. So I'm going to have a back stack. If I continue pressing back, all this background is going to be open and you don't want that. So I haven't read about uh, Navigation 2.0, but I'm pretty sure that's going to be strongly focused on these issues that we have on web and avoid these hacky solutions like I'm doing for this one. Uh, for this one that I have to do this hacky solution of, okay, how to avoid doing that? And it's pretty much doing this. I clear every single stack. I avoid the own generator routes to create the, the screens for me and the pages. Uh, and the other one, you tell me the second one, sorry. I uh, forgot. Uh, the yeah, second the question. second part was, were there any instances of you Im implementing features that were harder to build in Flutter than if you were building them um, using straight up web technologies. Hmm. Um, I can think about an example now. This probably, for example, the, uh, this is that uh, meeting should be an email, Teams Bay. Uh, I thought about more as a web approach than a mobile approach, because I think it will be more useful as a web one, because a lot of companies have their own Google calendars and they put the meetings there, but they put a comment, maybe they can share this link. Oh, and by the way, if you have the PWA, if the user press on that URL, it's going to open the PWA version if you got installed. If not, it's going to open the browser. It's going to send you a specific that one. Um, and one thing that is great, P, uh, the Flutter web, then things that you can do on the web is it's so easy to share on iOS, for the love of God. We know how difficult it is to get some apps approved on the App Store. And maybe it's just an example. Maybe it's just an open source thing that we need to share to someone and being able to install it on iOS. PWA works on, on iOS. So you can install on your iPad and on your iPhone. And if you use the standalone display on the manifest, it really looks like you're running a native app. So that approach is like go for web if you want to make those examples because you can share it with everyone, either iPhone, either Android, either web, blah, 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 and you name it. 
And if you have to pay for an account in iOS and maybe put users on a test flight and you approve them and like spending maybe two, three days just to share an example that maybe on the web you took like seconds to share a link and there you go, go ahead and install it. So there's few things that you can take approach on the web that are super useful that on native you can that easily. Uh, I will say more like the iOS approach of not being able to share that one. The rest, you can easily have like multiple things. By the way, you can detect the user agent with Flutter Web. Uh, and that one, you can know if the user is having an Android, iOS, or whatever. And you can suggest the user to download um, the app on like the native version of the app if you want to do that. So you can have like more commercial website uh, on the Flutter Web. And then in the, living in the same code, you can have the actual app, but like a landing page for the web that you can push that one into your like hosting. And then the rest of the app actually loading on native, having living both in the same project. And if the user comes to your landing page, you suggest them to download the app for their specific uh, OS and then download to the Play Store or the App Store. Um, I don't know. There's so many different things that you can do and play around between both platforms, mobile and uh, if not, you can use one code and okay, it's the same. You got native web, everything living in the same place. Uh, but I, I say you take the approach of the web as an extra tool to get more users because it's easy searchable. People are everywhere on the web. Links are so easy to click. Ticket users to the Play Store and App Store sometimes is not that easy. Even if it's literally open the Play Store with a link and install it, open a URL and instantly get in the, the information is a few steps easier, I will say. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, but if there is no any other question, that is pretty much my talk and I hope you'll enjoy it. Yes, thank you. That's thank awesome. you, Matt. Yeah, this was great. Thank you so much. Uh, let me just stop sharing. There you go. Uh, you can take control if you want to write in or not. Yeah. Um, well, again, you know, just like everybody else here, I want to thank you uh, for this talk. Um, hopefully, we got it recorded. Um, John, did were you able to record? Yeah, I was. Sweet, sweet. All right. So once he publishes that up. Um, I will send that out in the group and I'll probably also share it on Twitter um, with everybody. Um, but that is going to conclude everything for tonight. So we can uh, end a little bit early. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so Thank much, you. everyone. Yeah, that was awesome. Have a great night. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Stay safe, guys. Bye. You too. Bye. You too. Take care.